Good morning, and we are on a special Black Friday edition of Coffee with Rich. Uh, this morning, I had the honor of being joined by Scott Jedlinski of the Modern Samurai Project. It's been a long time coming, Scott. I've been wanting to get you on here forever, man. Oh, I'm super excited to be here, man. Super excited to be here. Well, I'm glad our schedules lined up, and I know that uh, a lot of people have been very excited to see this morning's show. So while we're waiting for them to get on... Let's talk about our amazing sponsors we have here at the American Warrior Show and Coffee with Rich. We have sponsors like Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. The Bob XL is a body opponent bag, extra long. And if you're into Muay Thai, Taekwondo, like Scott is, guess what? He's a great striking opponent. If you're also into a little BJJ like Scott and I are into, he also makes a great grappling opponent. If you're a shooter... Guess what? Take him to the range and he'll eat all the five, five, six you want to throw at him. <laughs> so please check out the Bob XL. And here's the best way to do it. Go to the American Warrior Show dot com on the right hand side of the page. There's links to all of our amazing sponsors and the discount codes that you get just for watching today's show. We also have the Cool Fire Trainer. Dry Fire, man, that's like 1987 or something. Why Dry Fire when you can Cool Fire? So please check out the Cool Fire Trainer to take your dry fire game to the next level. Remember, folks, all you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring, and you're going to get felt recoil. If you're a traveling and training firearms instructor like Scott is, being able to show new students the felt recoil is probably not always a bad idea. Like today, I'll be taking some folks to the range, and one of the things we're going to do is start out with the cert and then graduate to the Cool Fire, and then finally we'll be putting some live rounds down range. We also have amazing sponsors like APPHemp.com, which is Appalachian Standard, makers of the finest CBD products money can buy. Uh, they are uh, my good friend Jesse and I were in the Marines together, and Jesse and his beautiful family are growing the finest CBD products in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. And Asheville, if you haven't been, has an amazing craft beer scene. I highly recommend it. And check out Jesse and his family on their beautiful hemp farm while you're out there we got 17 folks joining us so far while I'm still talking about sponsors. Please hit that share button. You're definitely going to want to check out this. So while the, the wife or your significant other is running out to catch those Black Friday deals, I hope you're going to settle in with me and Scott as we discuss some really cool stuff. Got two more sponsors to talk about. Let's talk about Mountain Man Medical. That trauma kit is going to not only save your life, but potentially your loved one's lives. And as I've told you before, Mountain Man Medical, there's no Chinese knockoff products in here, folks. This is the good stuff. Uh, North American Rescue and some of the other vendors that you've come to know and love in the TCCC community. You can pick up a trauma kit today, a co-branded American Warrior Society Mountain Man Medical trauma kit for about the price of taking your family to dinner. And I think this is an investment that uh, you need to really consider, especially as things get more dangerous in our environment. Last but not least is Precision Holsters. Precision Holsters makers of the Ultra Appendix rig that I'm currently wearing right now. And uh, here later today, I'm going to be asking Scott what he thinks about appendix carry, and I think I already know <laughs> some of it. But PrecisionHolsters.com also has a, an amazing competition line. They also have the, um, the signature Mike Seeklander series of holsters as well. If you're looking for concealment comfort and affordability they got you covered folks you can get free shipping in a lifetime no questions asked guarantee check out precision holsters we got 25 folks on so far let's welcome some people to the show scott all right we got robert on this is good morning rich and scott we got will parker from montana alan kelly from free virginia he is coin number 1571 <laughs> and if you want to know what a coin number is please check out american warrior society and find out if becoming a member of our self-defense community is the right thing for you. Jesse is on from Mission. Says, good morning, gentlemen. He's coin number 2221. Wade Osborne is on. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving, he says. He's coin number 1488. Tammy is on from Colorado. Jason is on from New Hampshire. Got a very diverse crowd this morning, Scott. Nice. Outstanding. Let me read your uh, Scott's amazing bio, and we'll get into the show. <clears throat> Scott Jedlinski is a lifelong martial arts and when I say martial arts, I'm talking about Taekwondo, Muay Thai, BJJ. He has received hundreds of hours of training from people considered to be the best in the industry, ranging from tactical self-defense to competition. Scott is a masterclass shooter in USPSA and is the 16th recipient of the Fast Drill coin, along with being a three-stripe purple belt under 
Tony uh, Massos. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Passos. Passos, sorry. Yeah. Scott's classes and thoughts have been shared in media and publications like Primary and Secondary, Recall Magazine, the NRA Shooting Illustrated, Surefire's Field Notes series, Combat Handgun Magazine as well. He has been interviewed on well-known shows like Ballistic Radio, Firearms Nation, Concealed Carry Podcast, the American Warrior Show now, and Street yeah. Warrior Radio. Scott has been afforded the honor of instructing members from the Pentagon's ERT, U.S. Marshal Service, NYPD Instructor Cadre, Chicago SWAT, Ohio Tactical Officers Association, Texas Tactical Police Officers Association, George Mason University Police, Santa Ana, California PD, the FBI National Tactics Training Unit, U.S. Border Patrol, FEMU, Phoenix PD, Garland, Texas SWAT, Houston SWAT, Houston Narcotics, and many, many more. While Scott can teach many aspects of successful impl implementation of the pistol, his main focus is in the instruction of red dot equipped pistols. And that's probably where most people know you from, I would imagine, Scott. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. That's you my are story. The man. You are the man when it comes <laughs> to that red dot. Uh, plenty of good dudes out there. I think I just have a easy way to learn it. So we'll say that. Yeah, I think... Um, we were out working with a Phoenix PD a few months ago and uh, yeah. I want, and I want to say they had uh, referenced you and how they put their program together. Yeah. Uh, did, uh, with the cadre out there, great dudes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had a really, had a really good time out there with those guys, man. What a great, beautiful range, man. So. Oh, they're, they're phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. shooters for one. Yep. And well, they have to be, they have to be, it's Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, it is Phoenix. <laughs> And I didn't realize this until I went out there. Phoenix is like the fifth largest uh, city in the country. I mean, yeah. and, and they got oh, some, yeah. some serious problems out there, but they're they're whooping it on. Yep. yep. Wade is on. Tammy is on. Jason Monty is on. He says, Monty says, MSP alum from Frederick, Maryland. Elkie, nice. Elkie's on. Not a lot of folks on. Please hit that share button. Got 34 folks joining us live. So tell me, Scott, what is your bio overlook, man? Um, what is my bio overlook? Uh, not too much. I don't get into my, you know, life before I got into firearms. Um, so I was a mortgage banker for 26 years before I got in there, which is always interesting because, uh, when I do my demos, right. And, uh, I'll do my demos at varying speeds, right? And what I tell them is that I'm not going to say go slower, go faster. We're going to do it based on the present on uh, uh, the visual cues of my presentation. Ah, what's up, Lynn? How you doing, buddy? Um, and when I get done, I'll do I'll do a sub second draw, right? Cold. I say, look, guys, the thing I enjoy about myself is this: I don't give you an out. You can't say that I'm some barrel chested freedom fighting SWAT man, SEAL, Red, uh, Green Beret, you know. Marsock guy, right? I was a mortgage banker for 26 years before I did this, you know, because here's the deal. If I can do it, you can do it, right? Speed and accuracy come from efficiency. Efficiency comes from technique, not not a resume, you know? So so that, that's probably what it overlooks, but nobody wants to care that I'm a mortgage banker. So you got to make it sexy, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know what's funny, man, is <clears throat> you're so right. I think a lot of uh, former action guys really lean hard on the resume and it's like, I don't, I don't give a shit that you were cool in the nineties, man. What are you doing right now? Yeah. Are you, are you on the mats now? Are you on the range now? Well, you know, I don't have time or I got this back injury. I, I got, I was in the Marines for 23 years, man. I got all those injuries. I know I got screws right. holding stuff together. I get it, but absolutely. So, uh, what did you want to be when you were, when you were younger, what did you want to be when you grew up? A lawyer. Did you really? I like arguing with people, <laughs> <laughs> which in this industry, right, you, you do a lot of, right? Yeah. yeah, I think I wanted to be that. And I actually went, uh, uh, I went to uh, college at UNLV. My dad was in the Air Force, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Just so everybody knows, right? So everyone wonders why I got the name Jedi. You know, my buddy Jared Rustin said I gave that to myself. That's not the case. Okay. So I'm an Air Force kid, half Korean, half Polish, right? Uh and nobody can pronounce Jedlinski, and then they see the Korean eyes and like Jed, the uh, you're Jedi. So that's where my nickname comes from, right? So I'm an Air Force kid. My dad retired in Vegas because uh, he was a you know he loved playing poker and stuff. So he retired. Uh, we were out there. Went to went to UNLV, um, and I forgot why I was what, what the question was. All of a sudden, what was the question again? 
Well, we're talking about what you want to be when you when you grow oh, up. Oh, yeah. You said it on the so, turning, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, my call, my major in college was philosophy because I was going to go to law school, right? And then I met my wife when I was on a brief hiatus between sophomore and junior year. And like most good women, right, she pulled my head right out the backside and said. Nevada doesn't have a law school. So where do you think you're going? I was like, well, before I met you, I was going to go to UCLA and yada, yada, yada. She's like, no. So I switched, uh, I switched majors away from philosophy and then uh, got a degree in economics. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So that's what I want to be. I want to be a lawyer, but because I like to argue, but you know, you find out that when you get a business degree and actually go into business, uh, you're arguing just as much. So it's a good time. And then you become a firearms instructor, go on the Internet, and you're still arguing with people. <laughs> More so than if you'd been an attorney sometimes, right, Scott? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So you're an Air Force uh, kid. I mean, your yeah. dad's in the Air Force. So you're an Air Force brat. Yep. Uh, you, you go to school, philosophy. You're going to be an attorney. Your wife, God bless her takes you under her wing and squares yep. you away, yep. but you're a mortgage maker. So how does all that lead into martial arts and shooting Scott? Yeah. So, uh, when you're, when you're, you know, you, when you're a military kid, uh, you got a couple things to always do, right. Uh, there's always a baseball league, right. Uh, there's always, um, a soccer league, blah, blah, blah. And there's always at the community center, there's always a martial arts thing. Right. Um, and since the time, I think I was, eight i've been going to various you know taekwondo was everywhere it's either taekwondo or karate right so dad did karate a little bit uh but taekwondo you know grew up grew up through got a junior black belt nobody cares about taekwondo black belts anymore you know what i mean so got all that and it was a great thing then grew up and then you know when my dad settled down uh had a lot of friends that were uh into muay thai wrestled a little bit in high school not much i sucked you know but that was okay. But uh, how did I get into jujitsu was basically the question, I guess. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I say about here, uh, I live in, I live in Leesburg, Virginia, about 23 miles outside of DC, just on the free side of things. Um, and it's impossible to train jujitsu out here without training with face shooters, right? You had 20 dudes on the mat, <clears throat> 15 are going to be some level of law enforcement, whether local, state, or federal out here. Uh, I had a buddy, his name was Al. He was part of the State Department's MSD division. Huge guy, 6'5", 300 pounds, pure muscle, right? Um, but he kept on getting deployed, right? And when he came back, and the thing was, is, man, uh, he was winning, but he was winning out of hate. You know what I mean? And he was also getting hurt because of that same hate, right? And I said, hey, dude, why don't you come back? Uh, when you come back, let us I got a key to the gym. Let's train three times a day because we didn't have a lot of big guys at the school. And he was one of the few big guys. A lot of people, if I photograph small, but I'm a big dude. I'm 6'1", 290, right? Mm -hmm. And I just want to have a bigger guy to roll with. He uh, got his blue belt three months after we started doing that. And he said, hey, dude, I need to pay you back. I'm like, don't worry about it, dude. You're doing the country's work all good. He's like, no, I mean, do you shoot? And I said, well, I, I own a gun. He's like, well, let me show you some things, right? Uh, so he showed me some things, um, and I loved it. Very lucky where I live. There's a range, indoor range, five minutes from my house, so I could go shoot whenever I wanted to. Like, you know, I have an idea. I go shoot, you know? Uh, so that worked out. Started training about, I don't know, 2010, 2011-ish. Uh, and then it just kind of grew from there. So that's how I got into shooting. And then I just treated it as a martial art as I went on. You know, uh, my left knee is uh, is fake, right? Got that mm -hmm. done in 2013. So the only thing I could do for really three, four months was shoot. Um, and then it really started to develop into more of a martial art uh, for me instead of this separate activity like everybody teaches it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's how I got into shooting. So, What about the red dot? And I know we'll unpack this a lot more later in the show today but yeah. i just kind of like at what point did you say okay let's, let's explore this red dot so um 
I've always been kind of a, a, a kit guy. Like I'm into cars and stuff like that, right? I've always modified cars. I always souped them up, always enhanced the stereo. So I just, natural thing, right? And jujitsu, when I went to a school, we could wear any gi that you want, man. I was the guy rolling around and show your rolls and stuff and blah, 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 you know? Uh, for those of you that don't jujitsu, show your roll are very, very expensive gis, right? Oh, yeah. Are they better than any other gi? Meh. Can you flex when you're in pajamas? Absolutely. That's what they're for, right? Um so with the dot, right? So again, I wear glasses, right? Um, and, you know, the range there was like a lot of other ranges, you know, two shade light, the light content was two shades above the cave. Uh, and I, you know, I, I powered through with irons and stuff and got okay with irons. Um, and then I had a buddy that showed up with a FNX 45 tactical and a Burris fast fire. And he said, dude, just put the dot on the target and my whole world changed started researching it saw some things some other people had out there that were early adopters and said this is the way right uh bought a m p uh core when it first came out i think i threw a uh j point on there right jp rifles j point now known as the shield rms but back then it was 180 bucks i don't know what these brits are doing charging 430 for that piece of garbage optic, but whatever. I hope they're not your sponsor. No. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, struggled through that, then upgraded to an RMR, and then, you know, it just started going to classes, and everybody called me a cheater, and I just said, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. So That's right. So, yep. Okay, cool, man. So uh, are you running an RMR now? Uh, no. So the one thing about my thing, man, is that uh, – if I wanted to be committed to an optic, I really can't be, right? Because I have so many students that have so many optics and they all ask me questions about them. Uh, so I have to at least have a base understanding of the pros and cons of all those optics, right? Uh, if I have a rotation of uh, optics right now, um, you're going to have an RMR on one of my guns. If the, uh, say like the police department there, they do RMRs and they want me to run an RMR in class. I have that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the other rotation is in between an SRO, a Trichicon SRO, a hollow sun 509 T and the, uh, aim point acro P2. Now you're, um, are, is, is hollow sun one of your sponsors? No, 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 I will get, I won't, I won't pick up a sponsor from a uh, optics company, right? Um, because I don't want people to think I'm shilling for any individual company, right. right? Now I've done some consulting for all of them, right? Like for Trigicon, I, I did the media day for their, the RMRCC when it comes out. Uh, you know, I get what I want from most of these optic companies, right? But none of them pay me, none of them pay me. And that's the way I want it to be, right? I don't want, um, that i don't know it's just weird the farms industry you know how it is Hell you know yeah, yeah. everybody's about freedom yeah. and capitalism until you make a buck and then it you're a shell you know and that frustrates me you know what i mean that frustrates me even if it's a great product you know um yeah. so i don't want that uh illogical as it may be to taint my opinion or, or people's opinion of my opinion on dots right so everyone that comes out I give them a good Carlos try. Most of them, they send them to me, right? If one interests me, right, I'll reach out. I don't care. You know what I mean? I'll buy it. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to usually do that. But yeah, so that's that's that, those are the dots of my rotation right now. Sweet. Alan Kelly says, I I mentioned to Mike Seeklander on one of the last Coffee with Rich that I'm leaning toward a pistol with a red dot. I have monocular contacts as my eyes age. I'm having difficult with the front sight. Do you recommend one with my eyes? Absolutely. That's what it's, that's basically what it's made for. Um, you know, I wear glasses too. A lot of people say, you know, astigmatisms and yada, yada, yada. You just got to find the one that works with your individual astigmatism. Um, but yeah. Uh, if you can see us, if you can see a stop sign from 30 yards out, when you're, as you're driving your car, then you can see the dot, you know, so yeah. cause everything's target focus. Now, Scott, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on the show is your incredible amount of instructor time. Again, not just in shooting, but also in martial arts and, and the mm -hmm. groups and people you've had an opportunity to train with In your opinion, what makes a great instructor? Um, 
so the interesting thing, the same thing that makes a great instructor is the same thing that makes a great business person or a salesperson, right? Uh, you have to tell them who you are. You got to tell them what you're going to teach them and then teach them that. Okay. So that's what you do before class, right? Or, and when you get to class, uh, I, and again, this might get me in trouble. And if you're this instructor who absolutely disagrees with me, hey, man, you rock on, right? My way's a way, not the way, right? But uh, the days of supervised drills and GWAT stories needs to go away. They need to go away, right? Thank you for what you did. I have a lot of high-speed friends that did incredible work downrange. Thank you for what you absolutely did, right? But your skirmish on right out uh, right out uh, route irish has nothing to do with me trying to get out of the stop and rob okay so show me the skills if it's applicable within the story that you're telling me outstanding but we have got to stop doing supervised drills and start giving individual attention right in every single class and make people better make people better stop saying welcome to my class you're not going to get better but i'm going to show you how to practice what would anybody accept that in any other profession, right? Yeah. Would an IT, yeah, would an IT guy go to a trade show and go, hey, I'm going to show you this software, but you got to buy it first. And then after the 10,000 rep, it'll work. What? Yeah. Hey, I'm a personal trainer. You're not going to lose weight or get stronger until you buy my package. In the 10,000 class, you're actually going to get stronger. What? We only do that in the firearms industry because we have this rever reverence for resumes. We should have reverence for that person for what they did for this country. And God bless every single one of you. But that doesn't mean that I have to go to your class and not learn anything or you ignore me for the whole class. Does that make sense? It is. I, I think you're so on point and it's something that obviously we, we try to emphasize in our fire instructor development course, like unless you're trying to help a student gain tacit knowledge that they can't read from a book. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason you're sharing this little vignette about your life or your, your profession of one day you on route Irish to your, to use your metaphor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't want to hear it. It, it. It's irrelevant. You know, your war story while impactful to you and I get it, unless it has in some way imparts that, that little piece of knowledge that that's the thing that the student need to hear to add emphasis and gravitas to what you're saying. Why are you saying it? Right. Or save it till after class beers and cigars. Exactly. You know, you know so well, let's get to a couple yeah. of questions. If you don't mind, Scott. Sure. Absolutely. See. Mr. Mike Seeklander is on. He encourages everyone to share this morning. Uh, let's see. Jesse says that's very respectful. Not wanting to develop a bias because of money. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Scott, is there one or two dry fire exercises I should do to prepare for your class so that I can automate red dot presentation? No. I <laughs> to tell you. No, maybe people say it all that time. Uh, if you if you know the four firearms rules of safety, then that's all I care about that you know, right? I would rather have I would like you to have some background um uh some training, some basic training from a vetted firearms instructor. You know, I would like you to be able to get at least a 35 or 40 on dot torture, you know. Uh, but as long as you're safe, you can come to my class because I'm going to I'm not going to change everything. I'm going to. Uh, have you take a le different look at it from what you've been trained before? You know what I mean? It's uh, I'm not going to end. I'm not going to end uh take the shoot the skill of shooting and make it individualized and separate from the rest of the way your sports or athletics work right it's all the same thing the body works the way the body works you know just because you put your gun in your hand doesn't mean the laws of physics and kinesiology change mm -hmm. yeah spot on and I, I hear that a lot like I'm, I'm gonna take a few classes from these other guys before i come and train with y'all i'm like why would you do that how is, how is that going to help? Or I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the range and practice a lot and, and do before I come to your class. I'm like, well, how is that going to help you? If not anything, it's going to make our job harder. Yeah. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, man. I can't, um, I, I can't fault them for that for, cause for a lot of classes, right. you know, if they don't show up prepared and competent and what the curriculum is they get knife handed. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey man, I didn't come here to win the class. I came here to get, better so why are you knife handing me please stop and for those of you, you know, that don't know you this is a knife hand 
Yeah. Yeah. Tony yeah. says, good morning from Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, Shannon says, Scott is one of the best instructors I've had. He simplifies the learning so it's straightforward and understandable. And just a moment ago, Scott, you mentioned salesmanship and the role that it plays in instructorship. Uh, yep. Can you unpack that a little bit more, please? Oh, oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. So, look, one of people ask me how, you know, I guess I'm successful. I guess I'm teaching 100 classes a year. So, uh, that's working a lot, right? And people ask me how I got there, right? Well, the baseline is you have to be good with the pistol, guys, right? That's number one. You have to know why you're good with the pistol and how you got there, okay? Uh, but the other thing is that you have to be able to market, right? Because this is a capitalistic society, right? You need to tell them who you are, tell them what you're going to teach them, and then teach them that exact thing. It doesn't matter if you're teaching them firearms, trying to sell them a car, a mortgage, a furniture set, uh, a physical fitness package, a jujitsu school. It doesn't matter. You have to do those things and then you do it, right? Um, you know, often in this industry, because we have so many great Americans that have come from a silent professional background where you simply do not talk about the individual. That's amazing. I get it. I wish some guys who have retired would keep that mantra because they're talking way too much, right? But within your business, you have to, you have to market, right? You have to be able to sell your goods. You have to be able to, uh, this is what I tell my students, at least the the uh, the civilian open enrollment ones that come to my instructor class. I do a little thing about marketing and you need to figure out your uh, market meaning and mantra, right? And then you can figure out your own individual magic and you need to figure out why someone would come to your class instead of my class. And if you can't do that, you're going to have a struggle. You're going to have a struggle, right? So I had one guy go, hmm, well, I'm not better than you. After the class, I can't teach better than you. So why would they come to my class and not yours? I go, how often are you in your town? Well, all the time. How often am I in your town? Once a year. Okay, so then treat yourself as a feeder school to come to my class right? And that's why they should come to your class. That's the type of thinking we have to have. You know, you don't have to be a grandmaster world champion, you know, ground branch guy to make people better. You just have to understand what you're teaching down to the minutia and people will get better, even if they're a better shooter than you from the beginning. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's speaking of that, uh, you know, people asking for your advice, what is the best piece of shooting advice you ever got as you were coming up? Dry fire, <laughs> dry fire, dry fire, dry fire, and then dry fire some more, right? Um, dry fire is not as fun, right? Uh, dry fire is drilling in a jujitsu class, right? Uh, but the thing about dry fire is there's so many different aspects, right? You have manipulation of the firearm and then there's a very isolated thing of recoil, right? We take out the recoil management where with your patrons, they don't have to, cause they have the cool fire trainer, right? Uh, right. but everything else sans recoil can be practiced in your home, right? Uh, and it's actually easier because you can isolate, uh, skill building and deficiencies without the distraction of the bang in dry fire. There is not one world-class shooter or very, very, very good shooter that does not dry fire, except for maybe Rob Latham. Phil Strader, that's, that's too. Well, but you get, you get all that ammo, you know, what, what's Rob's thing? Yeah. The best dry fire is on the range with live fire. Hey man, yeah. if you can afford to do that, you knock yourself, <laughs> you can knock yourself out. The rest of us, not so much. Not so much. Well, I think that may feed into the next question. I'm, we may have just answered this next question, Scott, and that is what's the best piece of advice you ever gave? The, start doing jujitsu. Oh, <laughs> that's, that, yeah, that's a separate thing. We could talk about that later on. Uh, my best piece of advice is probably this from a, from a basis, from a basic um, standpoint, right? It's, you need to understand that the body works the way the body works, right? The laws of physics and kinesiology do not change from sport to sport to physical activity, physical activity. But for some reason, 
right? We put a gun in our hand and we think all that stuff changes. So fighting goes from this to weird stuff. You know <laughs> what I mean? And the interesting thing is, is that, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm not making fun of anybody, but, you know, we, I think we've grown beyond the isosceles type tactical turtle type of thing right but many of us doing that we're doing that for many many years but that's the reason why you can't find the dot right because that's your uh, your eyes are sunk into the top of your sockets your eyes control your posture your posture controls your speed strength and mobility right and when you lock out your arms and put your shoulders and head you induce what i call the pendulum and it just goes to poop i don't know if we can swear here so i'm not going to right but it yeah. just goes it just goes bad it just goes bad from there. But on the other hand, if we do it from like a fighting type of thing, eyes in the middle of our sockets the best that we possibly can, uh, posture good, right? We only have one moving axis instead of multiple moving axes. You're going to find the dot every single time, right? Every single time. But you do all that other goofy stuff and make it harder on yourself. No wonder you can't find it, you know? But you look cool. So that's all that matters. <laughs> what? Well, well you know, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning of the show, Scott, was this, uh, the thing you do as far as showing the sub-second uh, draw to fire yep. as kind of a demo to your students. Go, hey, look, this is my background and, and look what I did. And guess what? Then you have no excuse. But what what is the key to getting that fast? Is it just dry fire or what, what is it? Economy oh, of no, it's, te- what is it's it? yeah, it's economy of motion through technique. It's economy of motion through technique. So I so I wind up breaking down the way that I teach how to find the dot, right? And I won't go get away all the secret sauce, but I'll give you the overall formula on it, right? Is I teach the draw in reverse, okay? Uh, I teach it from a high compressed ready, front sight slightly proud, and then I teach them how to only have one moving axis and where that dot is going to come from so that they're not ahead of it, right? Um, uh, so, Rich, you're a, you're a blue belt under my very good friend, Cody Hudson, right? That's right. Yep. He says hello, though. Love that guy. Love probably that guy. What, uh, He's probably one of my top three gingers in the world. Anyway. That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, I teach it in reverse, right? Because the body works the way the body works, right? So we do that. Once we get that done, once we get that done, you are no longer worried about finding the dot in the presentation because like a, the analogy I was going to make with jujitsu, right? It's not the strongest guy who wins. It's not the fastest guy who wins. It's the guy that's three steps ahead. That first part of the presentation, I'm going to teach you how to get three steps ahead of the dot. So you're no longer worried about it because you're no longer worried about it. You stop over confirming that thing, right? Mm. Uh, and then we learn how to put our hands on the gun. Right. Uh, most people, when I say, hey, where do you put your hands together when your hands marry? Where it's, what's it in front of? And people go the center. And I go, well, bro, I'm six one two ninety. I got a big ass center. So yeah. what's it? right. And then just simply taking from oh, what other instructors have learned. Right. Uh, like the. Uh, oh, my gosh, I'm blanking right now. Recently passed Utah, former L.E. Ron Avery. Gosh, sorry. Two more. I ran through all my coffee too soon, right? So Ron Avery, when he did the whole clap thing, where your hand comes together in front of your sternum. That's where you marry your gun, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And then I talked to him about my concept of a wave, which uh, on this show, one of the reasons why I'm most excited about it, I'm big into giving credit where credit is due, right? One of the um, best pieces of advice is that I received was from Ernest Langdon when I started teaching a lot. He mm-hmm. said, look, Scott, you got to remember the best teachers are the best thieves to maintain honor, give credit where credit is due, right? Yeah. So when I teach my weight concept, it is an adaptation of the Judy chop. Okay. Mm, so yeah, absolutely. But instead of ch- saying chopping, I do a roll thing, right? Middle knuckle to middle knuckle because you can't feel your trigger guard. It's not part of your body, but you can feel your middle finger. And we, I grind up, over, and through. Right. Uh, and that drops the dot from, you know, wherever position that it is. It builds your grip north south instead of any east west variation that could affect your sight package. And it's a Judy. It, it's basically a Judy chop. But instead of a chop, it's a roll into it. Uh, you're a jujitsu guy. Right. Have you ever heard the term of a motorcycle grip? Right. Where you get the guy oh, yeah. in the back and you guys lapels. You're basically motorcycle gripping the gun but in the mm-hmm. same plane in which you're presenting it, right? And again, I give Mike credit for that because, you know, it's an adaptation of that uh, that I think resonates with people, right? Um, because everybody actually wants to chop when you hear that. And I turned it into more of a role. 
Um, so nothing new under the sun, only adaptations and different way to explain things. Uh, then we get to the draw, right? Uh, half my classes are from appendix. The other half are from like a duty rig because people knows that knows that's what I teach. I teach a couple draws from each one of them. Uh, more importantly, stabbing the gun out of the holster, right? Making sure that you either have the claw grip or if you're three o'clock, you know, that you're not causing undue friction between your stomach and your thumb. So instead of just grabbing and pulling, you're literally stabbing the gun, bouncing the gun out of the holster. So it's one motion, right? And generally what people do, depending on where they started from, right? If they have a two second draw, I'll get them down to 130. If they're a 120, 130 draw, I'll get them down to close to 110 or one, depending how on depending on how much they can bring in all that information that I'm giving them. That's outstanding, man. I I love it uh, because I think the economy of motion is one of the things that people often overlook. It's like, well, I'm just I don't have enough fast twitch muscle fiber. Uh, yeah, that's baloney. That's, that's baloney. Here, here's the other thing I sell them, Mike. Like, guys, like, you can't see this on the screen, but my elbows, that's locked out for me because when I was younger in jujitsu, I was an idiot and didn't tap enough, and my arms have been popped more times, right? So, yeah. you know, I can't lock them out. I'm trying to find the camera. I can't lock them out, right? I have my left knee is a knee replacement. My right knee will be one in January. And before COVID got a hold of me four months ago, I was 30 pounds heavier. And I was wow. still, still doing sub-second draws, right? Because guys, it's a pistol. It's not a, it's a two and a half pound tool. It's not a 30 pound kettlebell, right? Stop making everything so hard. Stop. Just move your eyes. Stop swinging your hips all over the place and weird stuff. It's just, it's a two and a half pound gun, man. Make it a two and a half pound gun and get it out and find the sight and pull the trigger, you know? So anyway, I get fired up on that. Sorry about that. Uh, no, dude, I love <laughs> it. I love it. I think some people overcomplicate this stuff. I think they really do. When or the, or they oversimplify it without giving enough detail, you know? Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, Johnny says, do you recommend Sage Dynamics Red Dot method of acquisition and presentation? So that's the thing. So Aaron's a friend of mine. We probably talk about once a month on this because, you know, as far as a, a prolific program, uh, he's the other guy teaching the dot as much as I am, right, for the most mm -hmm. part, right? So I, here's the thing, right? I'm going to be careful with this because I believe that Aaron used to say, bring it up to your nose, and then present it out on a fat, flat plane. But when I watch him shoot, he doesn't do that. So I don't know if he teaches that anymore. You'll have to forgive me. I've never been to Aaron's class. Um, but I don't know if he still teaches that. Uh, I don't I don't subscribe, right? And again, guys, here's the thing, guys. My way is O way, not the way, right? Any instructor who says they have the way and they're not a Mandalorian, F that guy. Okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't prescribe to the sideways L, right? I prescribe to the best way between two points is a straight path, right? So my straight path is sternum, right? Up, flatten out the gun with one moving axis. I think this takes too long, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on, and then we're talking about extension shooting. We're not talking about retention shooting, right? Uh, the two changes, the position two changes from retention. I love Craig Douglas. So, yeah. And Ernest Langdon, man, when he was, I was a corporal, he was a sergeant. Uh, he mm. was my instructor at a high risk personnel course, uh, literally 30 years ago. And, uh, I, I tell you what, he, he's, uh, he's an amazing guy. I just want to give sure. a little credit to him as far as Absolutely. teaching, teaching me the fundamentals of combat pistol shooting 30 years ago. And mm -hmm. most of what we learned there really has not changed much, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, tweaking on the margins, but it's, it's still shooting. Yep. And uh, so tell me this, what would you give? Because I, I want today's show to not just be red dot. I want, because I, I love the fact that you're kind of a well-rounded practitioner of self-defense. You've got the shooting side, the martial arts side. What advice, Scott, would you give to someone who's new to self-defense? Um, so it depends on what area they want to um, concentrate on first. Right. Uh, if their heart is into firearms, awesome. Right. Uh, but firearms training doesn't really take up a lot of time unless it's your job. Right. Mill or Ellie 
uh, depending on the department, right? Um, but so I would tell you that, you know, focus on that, find good instructors, stuff like that. But then my advice for everybody, go take jujitsu. Seriously, guys, if you guys not, and, and I say this and I get in trouble in my classes because I'll get like some dirty looks and stuff like that. I don't care. If you really get that mad at me, we can go roll and we'll can see what happens, right? Start taking jujitsu or take some martial arts, right? Something, right? But I, I tell people jujitsu, man, it's like, look, if you don't take jujitsu, you're not the meat eater that you think you are because I can break your, your ankle off your leg and stick it in your backside in about 20 seconds, right? Um, and until you understand that type of pressure, you understand how your body works under that type of pressure, um, there's a whole different world out there, man. There's a whole different world. When you're trying to get out and you can't breathe, man, it makes you tougher. It makes you tougher, right? Um, so after you take your firearms class, after you take your medical class, please take medical classes, right? Um, do it now, right? Go get yourself a medical kit and learn how to use that thing. Dark Angel, uh, Mountain Man. Uh, I love. I have my triple Mountain Man thing that I keep in my truck. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. Good dudes over there, Riley and stuff, right? Um, uh, but take jujitsu because here's the thing, guys. It's going to make you a better shooter. It's going to make you a better shooter. So that's what I would like people to do, right? Uh, Craig Douglas, I believe it was, said that, hey, man, if you can't beat up at least two of the 10 guys trying to get at you in that prison shower, you might want to think about not taking that carbine class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got some zingers man he does have some zingers i love that I love, man i love, I love it, it. i love that man so anyway so yeah i hope that answers the questions i'm sorry if i went off on a tangent man. oh brother you can have all the tangents you want this morning i'm enjoying it so what would okay so that's like someone new to self-defense but what about some yep. some of us old timers uh mm -hmm. scott that have been around the planet a few times or been around the sun a few times what advice would you give to that guy or gal um depending on what their goals were, right? So most of the time when somebody has the training experience that say uh, you and I have, right? It's it's not so much about tactics, it's about if people are starting to turn onto the performance thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do I get faster? How do I get more accurate without spending a whole bunch of time? Uh, the first thing I start off with is uh, when you go to an instructor, right? Um, depending on what your focus is if it's for competition then go to a competition guy right but there are not every instructor is the same right um i know mike's listening right now right uh and i saw a question from his i hope you you'll get to his question right but go to a guy that's done it all right uh if you're a self-defense guy and you're looking to get into competition to uh improve your core competencies of speed and accuracy then find the guy with that has the resume on both, right? Find the guy that was Mill, Ellie, and a high level competitive shooter. By the way, guys, I will say this. I don't think there's a single national level uh, pistol instructor that's actually good with a pistol that didn't get that way through competition. Yeah. I don't think there is, right? But, but right. so again, your Seeklanders, your Pannones, your um, – uh, Mike Greens, your uh, Matt Littles, your Frank Proctors, uh, even Kyle Lamb, you know, he, he talks about competition way back in the day and stuff like that. Uh, Tom Givens, right? Ernest Langdon. You know, Ernest Langdon. You, you, yeah. Right. So find that guy that has both the resumes, right? Especially if you're a self-defense guy. If you go to a straight competition guy and you ask him something that kind of borders on, he's going to look at you funny to call you a tactical Timmy. Right. And he's yeah. not going to understand because that's not his lane. Right. If you right. go to a guy who doesn't have any competition background whatsoever, you start asking about speed and accuracy. Uh, they're always going to default to accuracy. Right. And you're not going to get what you want out of it. What out of the, uh, what you want out of it. So look for the guy that has both on his resume. Uh, so that's what I tell people to look for oh, when great. they're when they're experienced like us. That's great, man. And thank you to the 45 folks that are still joining us live. We're on both platforms this morning, uh, Shooting Performance and the American Warrior Society. So thank you wherever you're joining us. Or maybe you're watching the show on, on our YouTube channel or listening to a podcast in the future. One of the things that you mentioned earlier, and I want to circle back to, Scott, uh, because it rings so true, specifically for me, and I know a lot of my uh, former law enforcement friends, is that 
reconfirming or o- over confirming the sites with a dot. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it speaks to something like you were talking about, like the competition guys are more apt to, to let the site wiggle or the site's doing what it's doing. And, and they're balancing that speed and accuracy w- really well. And one of the th- problems I have always had is that over confirming of the site. Can you unpack that a little bit? Sure. So the over confirming of the site is, is, uh, in my opinion, it's a couple of things um, and or a combination of two things, right? The first one is you're not ahead of what the dot's going to be. So when it appears, you can't really believe it's there, right? Because <laughs> you don't know where it's going to be coming from. Now, there are different techniques to come from, depending if you have, for example, what I do, you know, when both hands come together at the stern, as you come out, right? I say that the dot's going to drop from 12, okay? Whether or not you see the dot drop from 12, you know, I would rather you see it, but a lot of people would go, no, the dot just appears. Well, it's coming from somewhere, bro. It's All coming right. from somewhere, right? And the fact that it is above your irons, right? And most, uh, you know, most pistols are slightly canted up, right? You got the Glock with the 22, Walters with 20, and then everything else has an 18, depending on how that uh, uh, grip angle is. It's, you know, Glocks point to the sky. Well, where's the dot going to come from? It's going to come from the sky, and drop from 12, right? Unless you have a pure escalator uh, draw, then it comes from six, but it's coming from somewhere based on your draw. Know that. Know that if you aren't leaning forward, craning your neck, throwing your shoulder up, squatting, doing all that other stuff, and you only have one moving axis, for 90% of the people that dot drops from 12. Since you know that, you're ahead of it. If you're ahead of it, you're expecting it. If you're expecting it, triggers prep. When the dot's there, you go, right? Uh, so that's most people, they don't know where the dot's coming from. So when it appears, it's a surprise and they have to over confirm the surprise, right? Uh, the other one is that they're sucked into the dot. They're focusing on the dot back here because they're used to focusing on irons. And what they wind up doing is what they call over confirming. What they're actually doing is doing the eye sprinting thing, right? So it's dot target, dot target, dot target. And the problem with the reason, the problem with that is when, uh, you focus on the dot, you lose the relative size of the target in relation to the dot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to focus on the target, not the dot. So you don't lose it. Right. You look through the dot. The analogy I give in my class is uh, you're driving down the highway and then all of a sudden the bug hits you right on the windshield, right in front of your face. What do you do for like three milliseconds? You look at the bug and then what do you do? Oh my God, the road, that tiny little bug, Made you lose entire focus of the road, right? And that's what happens when you get sucked into the dot. So then what do you do? You throw on your windshield wipers and then you spread the guts all over your windshield and now it's worse. So how do you focus on the road? You look through the guts that you just put all over your windshield. Look through the dot at the target. You will be amazed at how accurate you will actually be. So those two things, yep, those two things will get you to stop over confirming. And then the third one, just... Just stop over confirming. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny though. I, I think, and I'm going to speak only for maybe the military, not so much, but definitely law enforcement. You, you're taught from the police academy on that, you know, every round you fire has your business card attached to it. Every single sure. one. Sure. And uh, so that over confirming of, oh, is it good? Is it good? Is it, you know, like you said, you're doing that sprint. Right. And that you're wasting time. You're just wasting time. That being said, right. And again, uh, I am very firm about staying in my lane, right? I do not teach tactics. I just teach the core competencies to uh, find and implement the the dot for speed and accuracy. That being said, for every body cam video you have seen, every active self-protection, every police activity, police post you've seen, have you ever seen anybody confirm their sights with a pistol? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. Right. It's also why we need to stop trapping and clicking the trigger because nobody does that in the test. Stop doing it in practice. You know, yes. so it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Oh, excellent. So um, we got some people that's going to probably hear this content, Scott, and they're going to they're going to be the new guy or gal that 2020 got them a little shook up. They went out, they bought their first firearm. They got their concealed yeah. carry and, and they're listening to you today. And what do you want to tell that guy or girl? Um, welcome to the lifestyle. Uh, your whole goal from now on is to learn how to be a craftsman 
with your tool. Okay. A craftsman knows that his tool is not a talisman, that it does not improve his skill, and that uh, all of the skill and the work comes from the craftsman, not the tool. Right. So please go out and get training. Okay. Uh, please understand your goal. What is your mission? Right. And everyone says, well, I'm just a civilian. I, have a, I don't have a mission. Baloney. Your mission is to protect your loved ones and get home at night. Nothing more, nothing less, and to live a happy life. In order to do that, in order to do that, you have to be a craftsman with your tool. Right. This is a lifestyle. Um, especially when you're going the, uh, into the uh, uh, arena of self-protection. You know what I mean? Um, so please do that. Uh, ignore the noise on the internet, right? Um, take the information for what it is, right? And, and uh, what do I mean by that? Um, there are plenty of people where I think their uh, class and their POI is amazing, but I wish never to speak to that person outside of their class. Right. But that's okay. I'm going to take the information. Right. I don't need to be buddies with a the guy. There's other people that I absolutely I love to death. I'll buy that dude dinner every time I see him. But when he talks about shooting, let's go ahead and because you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So take that, you know, that type of advice, that grain of salt. Now, if you have a great guy who can also teach you how to shoot, man, take all his classes, but don't get married to him. Right. You still need to expand yourself. Right. And see and seek out other instructors. So that's what I would tell them. Well said, sir. I see Elke says, great idea that your prescription glasses are also your eye pro Oakley, right? Question yep. mark. Yep. Yep. These are the uh, flak jacket twos. Uh, everyone goes like, hey, man, you forgot to take off your safety glasses. I go, uh, no, I'm on the range all the time. So I got these done. I absolutely love them. They're super comfortable. And uh, yeah. So I don't care. <laughs> well, and these are Oakley's too. And when I have yeah. them made, uh, I have them made with polycarbonate safety lenses. Yeah. So they, they look somewhat fashionable, but are still uh, safety rated Oakley Opro. Yeah, there you go. Our, our Cody is on. Good morning, Cody, my good friend and jujitsu coach. He says, better late than never. Glad to see two of my favorite people. Outstanding. Us. Yeah. <laughs> Love you, brother. And let's talk. Let's talk about while we got Cody watching this morning. Um, because you you've mentioned jujitsu several times, and I and you've unpacked it a little bit, like understanding pressure, understanding leverage, understanding body mechanics. But you know, you're a guy who's practiced a lot of different styles, and yet this is the one art that you highly encourage uh, people in self defense to do. Mm -hmm. um, are there additional reasons, or what did jujitsu teach you along your journey? uh efficiency and leverage right um so the thing with muay thai a lot of a lot of technique in muay thai more so than probably any of the other striking arts right uh boxing come is a sport but it is the sweet science right um but it takes a lot of work to unpack uh that very limited range of the sport uh Taekwondo, at least when I took Taekwondo, it was still a combat art, not the Russian line dancing you see the Olympics now, right? Um, but what Jiu Jitsu taught me is that, uh, so that whole martial art, martial skill type of thing, right? Jiu Jitsu is more of a martial skill than the other ones are because, you know, you can do, you can have the most beautiful flying roundhouse kick in the world, but if the dude's 10 yards away, it's not, not going to land. Right. Where with jujitsu, you understand range is more because I don't care how big and bad you are. If I've got my rear naked or my collar choke on you, I don't care how strong you are. Your carotid arteries are still nice and soft. Right. Uh, so it, it tells you, right. It gives you an immediate result and it gives you the process to the result, Right. And let's think of it like this, right? Uh, you walk into a Taekwondo Dojang or a Karate Dojo, right? Uh, for the first time, man, you can cut the testosterone with a knife when you walk in, right? Because no disrespect to those arts. I love them. I spent a lot of time in there. I think in combination with the grappling art, uh, both Karate and Taekwondo have proven to be very, very effective if you have a grappling uh, complement to them, right? But the problem is the reason why you can cut the... Uh, uh, 
the testosterone with a knife is that black belt world champion from South Korea knows, right? That if a 19 year old D one wrestler walks in there, he's going to whoop that butt. And it's not even going to be funny. So he has to get in the kid's head, right? It's like, Oh, you will learn how to count to 10 in Korean right now. You white dog, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then you walk into a jujitsu school, right? And they're like, hey, right. Actually, my jujitsu template guy, Samuel Brock. Hey, bro. What's hey, happening, bro. bro? Oh, cool. Welcome. Hey, so I'm going to go have you roll with the 16-year-old blue belt. Yeah, she's a girl. Don't worry. Right? Don't worry. And when she chokes you out, come back and sign up, bro. Right? Because we don't care. We know the technique works. And that's really the thing. Right? That and that's where so I come true, up with. Man. Yeah. It's where I come up with my tagline, right? It's speed and accuracy come from efficiency. Efficiency comes from technique. Understand the technique, then understand how to complement that technique by opening up the CNS, right? From technique, we get practice uh, uh, modules. From those practice modules, we learn where our efficiency is. From picking it up and going faster, we learn where our inconsistencies are, and then we refine them. And then before you know it, bam, you're fast and accurate. And it can work that quick. It can work that quickly. And you know in jujitsu, right, that, that time that you got the arm bar, but you didn't, you know, close your thighs and your knees, guy got out. And the professor says, close your knees and thighs. Boom. And you got it. And it worked right now. Not 10,000 reps slowly and smoothly in your grandmother's basement, right? Like the rest of the industry tells people. And then all of a sudden you get a ring on the doorbell and it's the UPS man with your speed and accuracy. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You do the technique. You learn the efficiency. You go faster. You open up the CNS. And then everything becomes easy. And then you can do all of your demos on demand in front of students without even thinking about it. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally, obviously agree with you. And I think, uh, you know, growing up, you know, there wasn't Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We didn't know what we didn't know. And we took striking arts. And I think one of the things about striking arts is we're constantly punching each other. So the relationship to your training partners is different than with Jiu Jitsu, where you're in this intimate range with your training partners all the time. And it fosters yep. better friendships, better camaraderie. I mean, I, I just love it. Yep. When do punches work best? You got a hold of the dude. You can't move. Right. When does yep. all of the wrist locks from Aikido and karate work when the dude's trapped in your guard and your thigh is behind his elbow and he can't move. Right. So there you go, man. There you go. Remember all that. Uh, I don't know if, how, how long you've been doing it, but, but that, uh, remember Wally J and small circle jujitsu, all of the flowing wrist locks and stuff from standing. I do all that stuff right now mm -hmm. from the guard, from the guard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have a purple belt in, uh, Aki Jiu Jitsu, which is all the Wally J kind of small circle stuff. And yeah, uh, I haven't done it in years, but I, I, I still use a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But think about it, right? Remember the whole, the whole classic wrist, like a grab my wrist, you trap the hand, roll around the wrist, right? Remember that wrist lock? And it never worked from standing because then the guy could just straighten out his elbow and there's no tension, right? Mm -hmm. You're in guard. Guess what? Get like, get like a high top knot guard, wrap his, uh, mm -hmm bring his elbow over, trap it with your thigh and all that stuff works now. And it's magic. It's awesome. Yeah. It is magic. I love it. So let's talk about uh, creating and maintaining a winning mindset. Okay. I think a lot of people talk about mindset, but I, and I think it may be personalized to every individual, which is why I like to ask my guests this Scott, but talk to me about that winning mindset. Is it something that you only developed on the mats or on the range, or is this something that you had in college or elsewhere? Um, I would tell you that my win, if, if I can be so bold to say that I have a winning mindset, I think the first time I became a winner, right? I was, um, how old was I? I was 19, right? And I always had this thing inside, uh, in, in my inner psyche that everything that I was good at 
I didn't care for, right? Like I was a great baseball player, man. Because of Taekwondo, I could do the full splits, played first base. I could dig any ball out of the dirt from the third baseman or shortstop that you could throw at me, right? But I hated baseball, man. I was bored out of my mind every time. The day that I graduated from high, I said, screw this, I'm done. And then I started playing basketball because I sucked at it, right? But uh, started playing basketball and with my friends. And then uh, I was a horrible basketball player, but got better through time and technique and stuff like that. And then we won city league. Right. And that, and that was the first time I said, look, I can do whatever I want to. If I set my mind to it, if I work hard, if I pursue the technique first and then put effort behind it. Right. So that's really where it came from. Um, you know, in my career in the mortgage industry, you know, uh, going from being just like a branch manager, trainee or loan officer into management, into, you know, uh, VP levels type of stuff. And it was always the same way. Find what the inefficiencies are, fix the inefficiency uh, and help other people get better. Um, which if you want to be a winner, man, um, you know, I don't want to go down this whole Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar thing. Right. But the best quote that's out there, the best quote that's out there is Zig Ziglar, who said, you will get everything you want out of life if you help other people get what they want out of life. Boom. Boom. You do that, right? You do that, right? And uh, the sky's the limit, right? And then you can have that winning mindset, right? Because as you help other people get better, you wind up getting better because you learn and then you apply it to yourself and then you can apply it to another person. And then you learn and, and it's that symbiotic relationship with your students and everyone else you're trying to uh, service with your business or whatever. And you just keep on getting better and better and better, right? Uh, I forget who said it, but sometimes an instructor, always a student. My POI, if you go to my class uh, six months ago and you come to my class today, the backbone will be the same, but the refinements always uh, increase because I learned different ways to say things, different things that resonate with students, things that applied across the board other than just that one person. And I get better and they get better and it's much easier to teach. And it's, a, it's amazing. It's amazing. So... Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, Luke says, that's why Scott is the best. Joey says, sound wisdom. And that's exactly what that is. Let's 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 talk about uh, what you're obviously known, known for uh, around the world, and that is the red dots. Mm -hmm. So tell us, Scott, of the current state of things with regard to the red dots. Tell us about where you see the future, anywhere you want to take that, sir. Man, it's a great time. Um in, you know, red dots, especially the way it was, maybe say, I don't know, this is almost 22, say around 13, 14, 15, where you were still that guy who was cheating and you don't need that crap and blah, 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 right? It's a great time. Uh, it's a great time for civilians. It's an amazing time for law enforcement. Um, half my classes are law enforcement and they're starting to see the way of the dot and making things easier, right? And I think one of the things that a dot does for everybody, right, but especially law enforcement uh, who have a higher, you know, propensity to have to use it, uh, is that the aiming system is so lucky or so, love, sorry, so easy with the proper technique that the focus comes off the firearm and goes on to solving the problem. Right. Um, that yep. they're not worried about, are they going to be able to put the bullet where they need it to go because it's a clear target focus and because they're not worried, they're ahead of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think those are the two things in law enforcement right now that as far as I'm seeing, I may be wrong. They're starting to be the most revolutionary things and that's the dot and jujitsu. Right. See how it always yes. comes back to jujitsu, man. Everything's jujitsu guys. Start doing jujitsu, please start doing, start now. Start uh, you're going to think for it. And, and so yep. many people are like, so many people watch our, the show, you know, they're, they're middle-aged men and women. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't know if it's too late for me. It's never too late for you. Now, now you, you'll like when I roll with a new person, I'm like, Hey man, I've had three knee surgeries. I've got a screw holding the shoulder together. If you know, let, let's work technique. Let's, let's flow. If yeah. you're going to, if you're going to muscle me and manhandle me, try to break something. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. So uh, William says, can you say which one you prefer for duty use? Because a lot of people watching or listening will be law enforcement. Scott, is there one that you prefer specifically for duty use? So duty use or 
Are we talking about that nebulous term, duty grade? Ooh. Ooh. What's, yeah. the, what's the, Unpack the difference, will, will you? <sighs> so if you listen to some people, they all describe to my buddy Aaron Cowan says, right, dropping guns from five feet mm. uh, onto hard concrete. Uh, I don't know about all that. Uh, you know, and Aaron in himself, himself says in his videos that, hey, if you don't like my test, I'm, it's a test. It's a test, right? But what's duty grade? Right. I mean, that's such a nebulous term, duty grade. Right. Here's what I here's what I will tell you. Right. Um, you need to define that for yourself. OK. Um, I know a lot of us don't have unlimited uh, money to T&E, but if you're talking about duty grade, you're talking about police and military. Uh, they're going to have a T&E budget. Right. We need to first start talking about features and benefits and what uh, and what resonates with you. OK. Um, for example, right. Uh, everybody wants to go to the closed emitters. That's a great idea, man. Absolutely. But why? Cause gunfights in the rain. So at all of my classes, I ask, I go, so, Hey guys, uh, yeah. Rain on your dot, scary stuff. How many OIS is with a pistol in the rain in your department? Oh, probably almost none. Zero. Yeah. So there have been two. There have been two. The first one, though, was at three yards. Ah, uh, yeah. Bro, your your gun is your sight at three yards. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number two, the second one was at 45 yards in the rain in Anchorage, Alaska. Everybody else had rifles on a Polish hostage situation. I'm like, did you hit him? I was like, I don't know. Like, mm. <laughs> so, so, all right. Didn't really count then, bro. You know what I mean? Other than that, hey, you know, but again, is it important? Well, you could be, you know, that guy that Colonel Cooper talks about, right? Statistics are cold comfort for the man that just got hit by lightning. So you need to address the issue. But think about the thing in its entirety. Don't just take what some cool guy on the internet says, like myself, okay? Uh, you need to test, vet, features and benefits. Okay. Uh, if you are a seal doing hard saltwater beach assaults and stuff like that, you need a closed emitter because an open emitter is not going to live up to that salt, that hard saltwater life. Right. Um, if you want a closed emitter, you knock yourself out. The thing that's more important about closed emitters with the 509 and the Acro P, P1 or P2 is that the nitrogen purging, right. Um, uh, prevents fog. Right. Fogging. And that's more of a legitimate concern, especially yeah. if you're in a humid area. Right. Or a super cold area. Uh, but just treat it. If you have an open emitter, treat it with cat crap. Yeah. Right. Or something like that. Um, can, we have time for a funny story about that. Uh, please. Absolutely. So I was teaching at OTA, the Ohio Tactical Officers Conference in 2018. A guy, a guy come up to me he was like, hey, man, I love the dot. But here's my problem. My AO is on a lake. Um uh, in Southeast Ohio, I'm really concerned about getting out of my air conditioned squad and going out into the uh, humid air and having it fog up. Right. I'm like, yeah, man, legit concern. Just treat it with something. If you're cheap, use rain X, right? If you want to be tactical, use cat crap or go, or do whatever you do for your prescription glasses. And he said, what? I said, you're prescription. You're so worried about glass fogging up. Surely you treat your prescription glasses. He goes, man, I never even thought about that. I go, well, check it out, homie. If this glass pointed to my optic, if this glass is clear and this glass is fogged up, you're not seeing anything, right? Mm -hmm. So think about the problem in its entirety, not what just some cool guy on the internet says, including me, including me, right? So, because it's either not a problem and you think it's a problem because somebody said it was, right? Or it is a problem and you just got super lucky up until now. But you need to investigate that, right? Because I don't care who that cool guy is, right? You, me, Aaron Cowan, Mike, uh, Pano, it doesn't matter. We are not coming to your self-defense shooting, right? That's right? We're not coming to your warrant. We might come to your match, but we're so busy, probably not, right? So at the end of the day, if you take everything we say part and parcel without vetting it out yourself and it doesn't work, that's your fault, man, right? So, so that's the thing about the dots, right? Uh, on you got to pick what it is as far as duty use goes. I will tell you this, guys, for everybody that doesn't like the SRO, here's the thing, man: big glass, clear dot, easy adjustments. But if you're that high speed guy that jumps out of uh, fast ropes out of helicopters and you always land on your holster, or when you transition to prone with your carbine, you always land on your holster, 
or you have a foot pursuit and you have to hop over a wall and you hit that wall with your holster first, or you drop your gun a lot. That is not the optic for you. By the way, if you come to my class and you're that guy, please let me know. All right. Please let me know. All right. <laughs> right. But yeah. if you're not that, but if you're not that guy and that big window, clear glass, easy adjustments, top loading batter resonates with you, you knock yourself out. Fort Worth, Texas, Fort Worth TBD, they've had the longest, like two and a half years of T and E. They just bought 400 SROs for their department. Wow. There Something to think about, right? Something to think yep. about. Well, and as uh, Seeklander points out, there are pros and cons each. He says, I've broken all the optics out there. Most are very yep. robust. And uh, Cody Hudson says, love the SRO. Yep. There you go, Joey man. Says, Joey says, I have a, a P1, love the clarity, closed emitter, et cetera, but battery life is suboptimal. And that's the thing, man. It's it, it's give and take it's, on all these things, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's, it's four to six weeks. Who cares, guys? Right? Yeah. But here's the thing. I got a P2. Five months, varying lighting sources or varying lighting brightnesses. Five months, great optic. And all the Aimpoint fanboys that used to come after me when I said the uh, P1's battery life was horrible, guess what? I got one. You don't. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Right. I love you guys. Knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Well, okay. Before I do that, I want to talk about future of the red okay. dot. I want to I want to take us there. Where what kind of red dots do you think we're going to see in five to ten years, Scott? Man, I, I will tell you. I actually had this thing of where the progression, just this wild hair idea, that the progression of it was going to be because what, what's the problem with the dot versus the irons? The irons you always see the iron's coming up in your peripheral, but that makes people lazy and their draw looks like that, right? You can't do that with the dot because of the closing housing. So you have to work on that efficient training. And I go, but what if you could solve and get the best words for both and have such, have a gla have glass that where that's strong enough to where you didn't need the top housing and you could almost see the dot come up. Um, then Aaron Cowan did a video from this one company that it's not a great optic, but they did that. And the sun went through the top of the glass and it was just horrible. So that kind of poo pooed that idea. Um, what is the future optics? Uh, I think that you're going to see more optics with more features and benefits. Um, I think the closed emitter is just going to be a natural progression, right? Because A, as technology gets uh, less and less expensive, the option of the closed emitter is not gonna be more expensive than an open emitter. And why not, if you can have it, right? Especially for the purposes of fogging, um, they're gonna become more robust with more features and benefits. And, and that's kind of where it's about. Uh, do I think that you're gonna have something that is going to be, that we can't even think of right now? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think that's good. Like I said before, it's going to go beyond the tool and more into the skill of the individual craftsman than anything else. Right. Uh, how long have we been saying, hey, man, uh, the semi-automatic pistol really hasn't changed since the early 1900s? Yeah, because it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> right. Let's start worrying about skill and stop worrying about the tool so much. You know, amen, man. You know, that's funny. And that speaks to probably human nature more than anything that humans love the next piece of kit or the, the little sure. gizmo or gadget. And, and Seeklander and I have always lamented that, like, I wish we had some gizmo to sell people because they're far more likely to do that than buy training. And that's unfortunate. It is. It is, you know, but for some of us that are getting up there in age and eventually want to retire, uh, those gizmos, help us make money while we're sleeping. And that's great. That's great. They, they do. But you know, and we talk about this too, uh, Scott, I want to get your opinion on it. It's like, yeah. look, man, you cannot buy skill. You're going to have to put in the work. You might be able to buy an edge on performance. Sure. With right. a little bit better optic or whatever, but as far yeah. as skill, you got to put in the reps. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. Right. But here's what I say, right. Kit matters. Kit does matter. Right. Um, yep. Yep. What? A, so, but here's the thing, right. Good kit's not going to make you better. It will remove obstacles. Right. There you go. And yeah. bad kit sure as anything can create obstacles. Right. Uh, so get the best kit you possibly can shoot a lot, train a lot. And that's the combination. Not this whole, you don't need that crap. Just go shoot more. Uh, yeah. Why not both though? 
Why yeah, not? I mean, but I could take a Burris Fast Fire and a and a G nineteen stock, and you could outshoot anybody, right? Um, most yeah, ninety nine point nine percent of the people out there, sure, because of your skill. Now, give you your your normal firearm, and of course, you take it to the next level. But yeah, but are you gonna? Can you take a Shield RMS and put it on a high point? And beat anybody else? No, no, no. no. You cannot. Right. So we, no, we got to be honest with ourselves. Uh, Mike, Mike says, Mike, I, I, <laughs> I a, "Yeah, that's hilarious, dude." Yeah, he says, hey, "I bought a box of skill years ago, and look at yeah. me now." Yeah, that's roll, funny. roll the Wilson combat commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. But you know, I, think he, I think he won his first national title though with with one of his Rock Islands when he was uh, repping for them. So, dude. And then that's the thing, right? Oh, I don't need that Filipino crap, blah, blah, blah. Dude, they make good guns, man. Yeah, man. They make, they make good guns. You know, it's like, well, I had to do this, this, and this to it. It's a 1911. Tell me the 1911 that you didn't have to do this, this, and that to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I don't know, man. It's good stuff, right? Uh, Mike and JJ were going to shoot that stuff if it wasn't legit. So, just something to that's think about, right? right? But yeah. you got to spend $6,000 on yours. So, whatever. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so uh now i will uh shift well let me back up because i was talking about the future mm. and you know my i don't you probably don't know this scott but some of the folks listening today my son is a research scientist for uh, a national laboratory and he's mm. especially his computer science and the other day he brought home this black box that only certain universities have he unzips it and you put it on your head and it's augmented reality and the things that they're doing with augmented reality is would literally blow everyone's oh, mind in Washington Bay. I bet. So, so the fact that you know it's a pretty sizable little headset you put on, but it's your reality, and then I can interlayer all this kind of stuff. So I think that, man, maybe twenty years from now, people are going to be shooting some sort of augmented reality glasses with their firearm. I mean, who knows mm -hmm. where we're going? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are trying to do that now. I mean, there's. There's YouTube videos out there where people are, are just dry firing stages based on YouTube videos, right? Yeah. Or yeah, why not? That's just the next level. So, and if you can get biometric feedback from it uh, to see exactly what you're doing other than human perception, which we know is a horrible shot timer, right? Yeah. Or the separated uh, perception of your coach, which works, but they're not connected to you. If you get that intermediary in between of measurement, why not? Man, that's exciting. That's exciting. Oh yeah. So so now I will shift gears. Okay. So we've we've seen 2020 this this crazy lawlessness. We've seen 2021, and and we can only speculate where this is going in the future, Scott. But I want to ask, kind of, what keeps you up at night, man? What what advice would you give to folks anywhere you want to take this, sir? Uh, so I'm going to take off my multicam hat, put on my tinfoil hat right now. Right. So I'm really not a conspiracy theory guy and stuff like that, but I, I will tell you this, man, if someone made a movie, right. Where people in power were trying to ruin this country and hand it over to a, uh, enemy world power, everything they're doing right now <laughs> would be exactly the way to do it. Right. If, if, 20 years ago, we heard about some of the stuff they're doing now. We would say, absolutely not. That's crazy. We would never let that happen. But guess, guess, what, guess what, guys? We're, uh, we're, we're doing it. We're doing it right now, right? So here's the thing, guys. Um, I, was, I, I will say this, and we'll keep it very compact. I don't want to go to the thing, right? But uh, support for good law enforcement, okay? Um, for those of you that aren't law enforcement out there, it is not enough to not criticize law enforcement. If you have a friend, a family, a neighbor, a relative that is anti-law enforcement, you need to nip that in the bud, right? With all, because here's the deal, right? Again, not to put on my tinfoil hat, but here's the whole thing, man. If you look back, go all the way back and look up Cloward Piven, right? They were hippies that wound up being like Harvard or Yale professors, right? They created Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky created Hillary Clinton and the rest of this weird left-wing thing going on. Right. And in their manifesto and how to take a uh, thriving capitalistic society and destroy it and make it into a communist society. One of the main key tenets in there is to make it into a police state. And the only way you make a thriving free country into a police state is by getting rid of the good police. 
right? And that is exactly what they are doing now. 100% what they are doing now, right? So every time you are quiet, right? And you let evil people do things without raising your voice and supporting good police, you are doing a disservice to everybody in this lifestyle, yourself and the American way. Sorry. That's how I feel. Amen, brother. Amen. Uh, Seeklander says, amen to uh, law enforcement. If you don't use your voice, then don't complain when the crap is knocking on your door. Yep. Yep. And, uh, Mike Seeklander also said, you know, who wants to go to one of Scott's courses with me next year? Let's do an AWS group. I, I, I'm down for that. That would I've that would be that. an honor. That would be an honor. But I'm going to flip it on you. I would like to go to a Mike Seeklander instructor class, man. Those things are like unicorn tails. You, if you find it, it's sold out. So if I could yeah. use some of the some of the you know magic here, I would love to get into one. Love to get into one. Consider it done. Consider it done. Yeah, we've got, I don't think we put our schedule out next year for our FIDC, but yeah, Karen is on this morning. She's trained with you, Karen Whitlock. She's yeah. an amazing instructor. Yes, ma'am. She yes, was sir. on her honor grad out of one of our courses. So uh, yeah. I want to also, so what can someone do in watching this morning? What can they do to become more resilient or harder to kill or whatever euphemism you want to use, Scott? What what can they do, man? And I know it has something to do with probably jujitsu, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, let, let, tell me about so that. So I'll, I'll give you an overview, right? And here's over: train all the ranges. Okay, there there are multiple ranges in any physical conflict, right? You can have a far intermediate range, which is firearms, right? You can have a intermediate range, which can be, you know, depending on what you're doing, uh, knives, you know, punches, elbows, knees, and stuff like that. And then you have close ranges, dirty boxing. Uh, uh, you know, stand up grappling, yada, yada. And then you have the ground, right? Train all the ranges. Do not have, not have an answer for one of those ranges, right? Uh, you know, uh, people ask me all the time. It's like, dude, do you shoot rifles? Of course I shoot rifles. I'm an American. What do you want from me? Right. That's not, I don't put it on the internet. Cause that's not my, that's not my shtick. Right. As far as what I teach and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but of course I do. Right. Because my home defense weapon is, a, is an AR, you know what I mean? Uh, because I've told myself I need to train all the ranges. For example, I, I, you know, I've taken a couple of knife classes. Man, I hate knives. Absolutely hate them. They are a disgusting object. But the last thing I want to do is not be able how to a, implement it or defend against it if I happen to be in that bad situation, right? So train all the ranges. And you cannot train those ranges without training a long gun, a pistol, a knife uh, without knowing, understanding what a striking art or grappling art is, right? And here's the thing. If you approach it in the correct way, everything that gets everything learns how to get better with everything and everything, right? Um, one of the things I say is like, hey, man, the minute you stop treating your pistol being different from your carbine, life gets easier. The minute you stop treating your pistol like you're uh, different from your jujitsu, life becomes easier, right? Train the ranges, get that knowledge, right? The only last thing I'll put in there, right, is the baddest man on the on the earth is someone who can put a hole in somebody and then fix them. Mm, there you go, right? My buddy it. Doc, my buddy Doc Spears, right? That dude's a brain surgeon, right? Former uh, former group guy, Green Beret, yada yada. I was like, dudes, dudes are badass because he can shoot you in the face and then fix you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I've asked that question. What, what can you do to make yourself harder to kill? And I've heard the gamut, but I love that approach, Scott. Train all the ranges. I, I love that. I'm so glad you unpacked that for people today. Yeah. Um, what What is your current EDC, if I may ask? Uh, so uh, if I'm talking about everything being kit, right, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but we'll just talk about the stuff that's sexy, right? So as far as my holster goes, I have my own pro model through tier one concealment. Um, it is the retention is based off the light, whether it's a stream light, surefire or mod light. Uh, it'll fit any gun up to uh, uh, Glock 19 size all the way to full five inch size because uh, it's off the gun. Uh, so that's that's what I use. Right. Uh, it's highly customizable in right height and uh, the uh, pressure that the claw grips off the side. Um, my belt right now, which is super important, especially with the stab I talk about. If you have a loose belt, it's just going to sink into your pants. Um, uh, I go between Blue Alpha gear belts, and right now I'm experimenting with the Core Essentials belt. 
man, what a good belt that thing is. And what a great price that thing is. It's, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, that, as far as my firearm goes, um, uh, Jared is scary, Mike. Yeah, well, if I have time, I'll tell you about him. Good Lord Almighty. Anyway, um, so uh, my gun, right? Uh, my EDC right now is a four and a half inch Walther uh, PDP. It has a uh, 509T on it uh, with a Mod Light PL350. Um, it was uh, stippled and customized by Monsoon Tactical. So it's awesome. Uh, my other EDC and my law enforcement uh, teaching gun um, is a five inch PDP that was uh, stippled. Uh, guys, the PDP, in my opinion, has the best factory stippling on the on uh, grip in the industry, right? Uh, but sometimes you just want a little bit more, you know, fun. And when friends offer to do things for you, you want to promote them, right? So yeah. the five inch was done by Boresight Solutions. Um, it is uh, modified slightly with some of the enhancements that I like to complement. Uh, the enhancements, my input, what I gave to the PDP when they were making it as well. Uh, that has the Acro P2 on it right now. And uh, mm -hmm. my iron sights that I'm doing with uh, my backup irons with through uh, CNH Precision and Night Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not, not a technically a, a correct term, but they're low witness, right? So instead of a one third or one eighth, they're more like a one sixteenth. Mm -hmm. So you barely see them through the top, but just enough to make accurate shots at a uh, conscionable distance with irons. Um, it, so yeah. that, just, just, just because we hadn't unpacked that yet, Scott, and I'd be remiss to not ask it. So is that kind of your go-to when it comes to backup irons for your red dot? Yeah. Yeah. That Guys, backup irons. Yeah. Backup irons. Just do it. Yeah. I know you read the recoil ad and, or the mag article, and that was a great article to give you a different perspective. But here's the thing. A, your gun's already milled for them. OK, B, they don't slow you down. C, stop trying to find the dot by using your irons. That's silly. You're going backwards. But in weird angle positions where your head cannot be upright with the gun upright, right? Say under or around cars or under hard barrier leans and stuff like that. Man, sometimes in those weird, you know, off axis positions, Sometimes you can use the irons to bring in the dot in those weird positions. Don't do it when you're standing up. You're slower, right? But sometimes, you know, why not, right? Uh, I talk about gross sight pictures up close where it's back of slide, glass, top of the optic. Why not have another gross sight picture, which are your irons there, right? Uh -huh. And you're going to look silly with those slots in it that don't have anything in them. Stop doing that. Anyway, that's me. <laughs> wow. I love it. So, uh, <laughs> last series of questions, Scott, is like, I, I know I've kept you on here quite a bit. No, I'm, I'm talk, great. Yeah. I want to talk about your training company, man. What made you start it and what's the future look like for, for you guys at Modern Samurai? Okay. So, uh, so when I first started, Modern Samurai Project is super interesting in that uh, it was just a, it was my blog. It was my enthusiast thing. Okay. Um, I had one out there. So I was talking to my buddy, Greg Higgins, that I went to high school with, which is uh, funny because my first logo kind of came from Greg. If anybody out there uh, was a, a skateboarder when they were younger, and if you heard of uh, Mike Vallely, he was a very famous pro skater. Uh, Greg has done his graphics since 1988. So I was talking to Greg and he's like, dude, what's going on? It's like, dude, you're into all this stuff. You're into jujitsu and you're into shooting. And I was also very much into cars. It's like, you're like this modern samurai project type thing. I'm like, what did you just say? Right. And the funniest thing is, right, as as uh, large as the company is growing and stuff like that, Greg is the most bleeding heart liberal hippie on the face of the earth. And the name came from him. I love it. Wow. I love it. Right. Uh, so I just started doing that. Didn't really want to get into instructing. Right. Uh, did the natural path, you know, uh, of anything else, just like jujitsu. Right. You get sick of rolling with the same guy. So you go compete. Right. Uh, I knew that to get to that next level to discover who I was, I needed to compete. So I started doing that, started taking classes, yada, 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 start writing on my blog and everything. Um, sorry, got my NRA instructorship, started doing some small private lessons for 
friends and family. Uh, and then somehow I got, I fell in with the guys at primary and secondary, right? Um, I think they liked me because even though I didn't have the resume of being, you know, a face shooter or something like that, I think all those guys are afraid of people who can do it with their hands. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Right. So I was kind of like the cool civilian that wasn't an idiot that could lend some opinions to that. Right. Uh, and then uh, Matt Landfair, who owns primary and secondary, uh, told me I needed to start teaching. And I'm like, mm, guys, I just I like my status, man. I'm like an elite student. I go to the class. I get treated well. I don't you guys can't agree on anything. I don't want nothing like that. Right. Uh, so that was probably 2017. Uh, Trump gets elected in 16. Right. And even though that was the right choice, the problem is in the mortgage industry, when presidents are good for business or anything happens good for business, rates go up. So half my business with refinances went away. I need to supplement that. I'm like, fine, dude, let's do this, right? Uh, so we did it and a 20 person class sold out in an hour. Wow. Uh, and then people started calling me to host and man, I'm like, this is awesome. This is better than working for a living, right? And then I got invited to teach at Shooter Symposium next to greats like Pannone, Pressburg, Blowers, uh, Kerry Davis. And then Houston PD went full nuts on the dot. And that's mm -hmm. when police departments started calling, right? Uh, and then it just went, went boom from there, you know, uh, 75 classes one year, then 100 classes, you know, uh, cops like to train during the week and open enrollments during the weekend. And uh, then cool things started happening. The FBI called, right? I thought it was a prank at the beginning, but no, nope, they called uh, the U.S. Marshals, which is probably my favorite federal agency, by the way, are the U.S. Marshals because they love their job. All they do is hunt men. You know what I mean? Uh they train a lot. They have a great attitude. They talk a lot of crap and they pay on time, which is why they're my favorite. So, you know, so yeah. So what's the future? Um, 2022 and 2023 right now, they're locked. The schedule wow. is done. Yeah. We're booking in at 24 and 25 right now. And uh, yeah, that's the future. Just having a good time. I'm getting better. Um, I got to work some time in there. Uh, you know, a quick, can I give you a question to ask me that nobody asks me on these podcasts? Heck yeah, buddy. What's the downside of having this successful of a business, right? Uh, a, I've been a three strike purple belt since 2011 because oh. I don't have to, I, if I roll twice a month, I'm lucky. Uh, number two, uh, I hit master class in USPSA. I think I'm like 89, 90% right now. I don't have any time to go to a matches. I would really like my GM card, but I just don't have time to dedicate myself to that amount of training uh, and go to matches. Those are the two downsides of it, right? Other than that, it's awesome, man. It's better than working for a living. So, Yeah, I tell you, the, the life of a traveling trainer, everybody thinks it's really sexy, but it is exhausting to to be out on the road i mean it's exciting it's fun and everything but i tell you it's it takes a toll or can take a toll on the family um living that lifestyle yeah i'm very lucky uh my wife she's she's the real magic behind the company she works 15 hours a day managing vendors sponsors hosts uh schedules wait lists um disgruntled people because they can't believe i don't can't do a class there until 2024 or you know stuff like that right she's she's yeah. absolutely amazing uh the hardest of chargers a jiu-jitsu blue belt so all right yeah 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 so she's she's i call her the machine really couldn't do any of this without her so yeah that that's amazing i i, I married my high school sweetheart and we're still together 35 years later i can that's awesome that, man how awesome a, an amazing wife can be and uh, Karen gives the clap, thumbs up to Beverly and Shannon says, yeah, Beverly Jelinski is the bomb. Yes, 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 go. sir. Yes, sir. Well, Scott, thank you for being on here this morning, man. Uh, any final thoughts for those watching or listening today? Um, I don't, you know, not really. I think I, we covered a lot. Those were all really great questions. I think it was a really good in-depth interview, which I really, really enjoy. Gives me a chance to rant a little bit and get stuff out there. Um, if I want to close anything, right? Um, I want to uh, 
thank you guys for what you do, man. I've been a I've been a fan of the American War Society for a long time. I think I've listened to most, if not all, of your uh, episodes and stuff like that. Um, thanking you and and thanking Mike. You know, uh, I know he's listening and stuff like that. But you know, the thing about this industry is, uh, you know, who's our Kevin Bacon in the industry? Colonel Cooper. Right. And once you start understanding that lineage, right. Uh, one of my biggest influences uh, in the shooting uh, world or yeah, probably shooting world helped me because he's an outstanding individual was Tim Heron. Right. And uh, Tim Heron uh, gained his uh, higher level of understanding through Mike. Right. Uh, yeah. And the first time he went to Mike's class and stuff like that. So just thanking, giving credit where credit is due and getting back to that lineage and understanding that uh, not only are we all connected to the firearms industry, we're all connected as Americans. We're all connected in this lifestyle and just kind of be true to that. And uh, you honor that lineage by making yourself better. Yeah. I love it. Spot on guys. Scott, thank you, brother. I, I definitely want to pull you in for a round two, man. I know that oh, I'd love schedule, to. your schedule is so, so tight. And Mike C. Clander, I know you're listening, brother. You need to get, uh, listen to what Scott is saying as far as getting those calendars locked on years in advance. Uh, I think that's a, that's an amazing way to do it. Alan Kelly says, great show. Pick up a lot of information. Enjoyed it big time. Gerald D's. Thank you for your time. Joey, solid show. Skip. William, everybody's loving today's content. And I thank you, Scott, for being an amazing guest. Yeah, it was an honor to be here, truly. Well, remember, folks, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>